My name is Sean Codrand and here with me is Aaron Curry. We are both transportation planners with the sustainable development team at the North Central Texas Council of Governments or NCT COG. Uh, in conjunction with the city of Bald Springs, uh, NCT COG is developing this planning study for the Hickory Tree Road corridor. During this presentation, we'll review the project activities and preliminary recommendations. Then on the web page that you see the link to on the bottom right corner there, we have also linked some of the materials shown in the video separately to make them easier for you to view. In addition, there's a link to a brief seven question feedback form as well as a link to a community survey that we have ongoing uh, about the project. Your feedback is really important to us, so we hope that you can take a few minutes to submit this form and the survey. So I want to start by telling you a little bit about the North Central Texas Council of Governments. Uh, we are the Metropolitan Planning Organization of the, for the Dallas-Fort Worth region, which is comprised of the 12 counties that you see in blue in the map to your right there. Uh, the Metropolitan Planning Organization exists to conduct regional transportation planning processes, and we also process and distribute uh, federal and state and local funding out to the region for transportation planning and transportation project implementation. The Regional Transportation Council is our governing body um, and they are represented, represented um, by representatives, representatives throughout the region. Um, they vote on transportation actions and fund projects and programs uh, throughout the region as well. OK, we're going to talk a little bit about the background of this project. The purpose of this project um, is to develop a planning study for this corridor. Um, the city of Bald Springs is pursuing reconstruction of the Hickory Tree Road corridor from Elan Road to Bruton Road um, with the aim of better accommodating bicycle and pedestrian access, um, tr better accommodating traffic, and also supporting economic development. So NCT COG is developing a planning study of the corridor to identify high level concepts and recommendations these recommendations will feed into the roadway design, uh, which will be the second phase of the project and will also have its own uh, public participation opportunities. The public engagement opportunity is part of the process for obtaining feedback on the proposed concepts and recommendations that we'll talk about here to ensure that the project is helping to achieve community goals. The purpose of this is to obtain feedback from community members with an interest in the Hickory Tree Road corridor. The goals of the project include developing a context sensitive design recommendations for the corridor. And when we say context sensitive, we're talking about design that fits the roadway's human and natural environment and meets the needs of the community. So it's fitting into the existing context of the community. The intent of the recommendations include um, enhancing bicycle and pedestrian experiences along the roadway in particular, uh, increasing safety and increasing comfort for bicyclists and pedestrians uh, traveling to key points along the, the corridor. Uh, connecting key amenities and services, including schools, parks, municipal buildings, and commercial areas that exist in the study area, and also facilitating economic opportunity in the area. So back in May of 2020, the city submitted to a funding proposal to the North Central Texas Council of Governments. Um, and in June of 2020, the Regional Transportation Council funded a corridor planning study that was to be conducted by NCT COG staff to develop a context sensitive corridor plan from Elan Road to Bruton. In April of 2021, the RTC approved what we called the COVID round four funding award uh, for phase one of Hickory Tree Road construction going from Elam Road to Lake June. Um, this was a 13.5 million total award. This included, includes $8.2 million of federal transportation funding, 5.3 million of local um, transportation funding in the form of a grant um, that the city received from Dallas County, as well as 260,000 regional transportation development credits um, that are maintained by the North Central Texas Council of Governments. The anticipated um, uh, phasing of the project will occur during fiscal years 22 to 25. They'll, they'll uh, be composed of design and engineering and right-of-way acquisition, utilities, relocation, and, and construction. 
The funding partners for the project include NCT Cog County, uh, TxDOT, and the City of Bulb Springs. So this map shows the planning project limits. Uh, we are looking at the uh, corridor on Hickory Tree Road from Bruton Road all the way down to Elam Road. The corridor length is 2.03 miles. And on this map, you can also see some of the areas of interest that we're especially interested in connecting and making sure people can access safely and comfortably, which include uh, uh, several parks, uh, uh, two elementary schools, um, as well as uh, some major commercial at the major intersections on the corridor and municipal uses such as the municipal center, the post office, and other points of interest along the corridor. This timeline uh, outlines where we're at to date. So it, back in May, May of 2020 was the initial funding request that was submitted by the city. In December of 2020, NCT COG staff and the City of Belt Springs and, and uh, ISD staff uh, conducted a uh, corridor walk audit um, to look at conditions along the corridor and uh, look at where um, improvements might need, might be needed and generally conditions um, that needed to be considered. In February of 2021, we had a, a community survey that opened. In May of 2021, we conducted uh, site visits to the two elementary schools on the corridor to look at um, pick up and drop off uh, activities that were occurring at those school sites and how they may be impacting traffic and other conditions on Hickory Tree Road. In June of 2021, we had stakeholder meetings with both business stakeholders who were located along the corridor as well as residents who live along the corridor. In September of November, in September to November of 2021, we are holding this current public input opportunity. So that will be open from now through October. In addition, um, in November of 2021, the resident survey will actually close and then we are anticipating planning project completion in early 2022. Okay, so with that, uh, Aaron is going to come on the line now and discuss our data collection and existing conditions work that has occurred to date. All right, thanks, Jill. So first I'm going to talk about our ongoing online survey, which as Sean mentioned, opened back in February. We expect to close it in November. It's currently hosted on that Balch Springs website. Um, if you haven't taken it already, it's still live. Please take the time to take it. It takes about 10 minutes. Um, the questions asked during that survey are about travel modes on the study corridor, safety concerns, and future visions for the corridor. And along with the resources provided on this public feedback website, we have preliminary survey results as of September 10th. So I'm going to briefly go over some of the survey results um, that we've seen so far, starting with what is your vision for the corridor in the future? And we allow participants to select all that applied. So the most popular answer was a place where residents can safely walk and bicycle to destinations, which had 119 votes, followed by a place where traffic can pass through quickly and easily with 74 votes. The next question was, rate the difficulty of exiting driveways on the study corridor. So we found that the majority of people had issues at least weekly, which included responses of three or more times a week, multiple times a week, and at least once a week. We then asked, if you had difficulty exiting driveways, what kinds of driveways were the most difficult? And we found that commercial had the most answers with 92, residential had 56. So then we broke it down even further and asked specifically which driveways were the most difficult. And there we found that Floyd Elementary was by far the most popular. And then the post office came in as the second most popular answer. We then asked how often do participants experience delays due to traffic congestion while driving? We very similarly found that the majority of people had issues at least weekly on the corridor 
which again included that three or more times, multiple times, or at least once a week. And so the last question I'll share is, are there driver behaviors that you think are a problem along the study corridor? We again allowed participants to select all that applied. The most popular response was yielding to pedestrians in crosswalks, followed by speeding, and then leaving safe distances between other road users when passing. So here we have some crash maps that were created from data between 2015 and 2019 on the study corridor, thanks to our NCT COG safety team. Um, I'll point out that there were three bicycle or pedestrian involved crashes on the corridor, one of those occurring at Hickory Tree and Bruton, the other two occurring at Hickory Tree and Crumpton Road. Luckily, there were no fatalities on the corridor during this time period. So now we have a closer look at the three major intersections on the corridor, Bruton, Lake June, and Elam. And here we see that most of the crashes were occurring at these intersections. But most notably, I wanted to point out that there was a 24 crash cluster just south of Lake June Road in front of the um, little strip mall there that we're keeping an extra close eye on. So moving on, um, as Sean said, we completed a walk audit with the city of Balch Springs back in December. And our goal for that walk audit was to examine existing conditions of the study area and to identify some existing problems. We found that there was a lot of pedestrian desire in areas that sidewalks do not exist, as shown by the dirt path that has been worn away by people walking on the right. We also found many challenges for less mobile pedestrians to walk safely outside of travel lanes, including drainage ditches, pavement cracking on shoulders, water lines, trash cans, mailboxes, litter, and debris along the roads. We also observed that there was very faded road paint for both the actual roadway lines and the crosswalks, which can be very confusing for both drivers and pedestrians trying to walk and drive safely. We also found that there were many drivers that were speeding on the roadway and very few gave space to pass pedestrians safely. Back in May, we did a school site visit at McWhorter Elementary, where the goal was to observe the school dismissal process and how the dismissal process affected roadway conditions during that pickup window. So by talking to ISD staff, as well as watching dismissal happen, we found that students in kindergarten to second grade with no older siblings are picked up in the front driveway along Hickory Tree Road and older students from grades three to five and their younger siblings are picked up on the larger back driveway on the quarter drive. Some observations that we saw was that back up from that front driveway on Hickory Tree overflowed onto the road while parents were waiting to pick up their students. We found the most traffic happening from 304 to 310 for that 305 dismissal. We also found that backup was caused on Hickory Tree Road from cars waiting in line to turn on a McWhorter since those cars backed up from that driveway all the way back to Hickory Tree. We also observed some students walking southbound on Hickory Tree Road, avoiding both the travel lanes and the drainage ditch by walking in a very small grassy area. So supporting our observations at McWhorter, we created some congestion maps to help visualize all of our written observations. So to orient everyone, the blue lines represent the crossing guard locations where those guards were helping students cross traffic. The red bars represent different levels of observed congestion. So the darker red areas are areas where traffic was almost always there. And then the more pink areas represent more of the extent of the peak levels of traffic. So the front driveway on Hickory Tree that picks up the younger students, um, we saw that backups were occurring starting at about three o'clock for parents waiting to turn into the driveway and that front driveway cleared by about 3 15. the back driveway which held the older students and their younger siblings um, we saw that congestion on McWhorter extended in both directions but was most prominent on the direction heading towards hickory tree where we observed backups for parents waiting to turn into that driveway actually extend on Hickory Tree, where we saw visible queuing for that McWhorter drive turn at about 2.58. We saw that back driveway clear by about 3.20. 
Moving on to our second school site visit to Floyd Elementary, we had the similar goal of observing that school dismissal and the surrounding roadway conditions. We found that backups on Hickory Tree Road were most like were most often caused by crossing guards stopping to let children cross. Those locations for the crossing guards are at Terry Drive and at the Southern Driveway near Campa Drive. We observed most students crossing the Southern Driveway and learned from staff that they are walking down Campa Drive towards the town homes on, on Quail. Students walked along the Southern Driveway of the school and then uh, entered the sidewalk to exit the school. We also observed cars waiting to turn from that Southern Driveway exit backing up all the way to the school building. We also created a congestion map for this dismissal process. As I said, backups on Hickory Tree were most often caused by crossing guards stopping traffic for students during that dismissal window of about 3.05 to 3.20. Um, and then we also observed the queue for drivers waiting to exit the school grounds backing up the length of the driveway. We saw that dismissal complete by around 3.20. All right, and Sean's gonna pick it up and continue on. All right, thank you, Erin. Uh, yes, I'm going to continue on, on and talk about major considerations that we looked at in developing the recommendations for the study. So one of the big group of or considerations that we looked at um, pertains to utilities. So along the corridor, there are many areas with above and below ground utilities that may need to be moved um, as the result of this construction project. So some examples of these that you see pictured here include fiber optic cables, utility poles, drainage ditches, and gas lines. Another area of consideration that we looked at closely is access management. So access management techniques are techniques that are used to increase roadway capacity, manage congestion, and reduce crashes uh, with the entrances and exits to the roadway. So often with exits and entrances to roadways, um, they can um, be difficult to get in or out of depending on the congestion levels. And um, they can also result in um, backups of traffic uh, because of cars trying to get in and out. So um, we took a very close look at this because there are numerous residential and commercial and municipal driveways along the entire corridor. So this is a map showing all of those driveways. There are 121 driveways on the corridor, 66 single family and 21 commercial. Um, the uh, survey that we have going on right now uh, to date has shown that 116 survey respondents reported difficulty exiting driveways at least once a week. Um, and then commercial drivers were found to be the most challenging followed by residential driveways. Some other considerations that we looked at are were pass through traffic. So pass through traffic is related to traffic that is traveling on the roadway that does not begin or end in the study corridor. So this is traffic that is using the corridor to get to someplace else. Hickory tree is used for cut through traffic by people avoiding the Elam Road in 635 interchange. Um, down there you can see on the lower right of the map. Um, and so that is adding uh, people onto the corridor. Drivers also use Hickory Tree Road to access 635 to the north or south of Elam Road. And then um, the drivers also use Hickory Tree Road to avoid a five-way intersection and signal at Bruton and Peachtree. Those were our major areas of, of considerations um, for developing these preliminary recommendations, which I'm going to discuss now. So our major uh, recommendation has to do with the roadway cross-section. NCT COG's cross-section recommendation is uh, con uh, transforming this existing roadway into a th three-lane roadway with a center turn lane and pedestrian refuge islands at key crossing locations. Some of the major considerations that went into this, as we discussed before, include access to homes and businesses, congestion management, queuing for pickup and drop off at schools, bicycle safety and improvements, and pedestrian crossing treatments. 
And why did we land on this recommendation? This was really the best, re best um, design and recommendation that would help to balance all of these competing interests and would improve access to businesses and residences, as well as improving congestion, while also providing room for bicyclists and pedestrians to travel safely, safely improving safety for bicycles and pedestrians, and also accommodating future traffic volumes. So uh, this lays out the NCT COGS recommendation for the cross sections. Um, the, on the bottom, you can see the current cross section um, for the roadway. This is a typical cross section. It varies a little bit um, depending on where you are in the corridor. Uh, this existing uh, cross section is composed of 11 foot driveways and two foot shoulders, as well as approximately 17 foot feet of frontage um, in front of buildings. And then the recommend, recommended three lane cross section, you can see at the top there, adds pedestrian refuges at key locations. So this has a 12 foot center turn lane or otherwise known as a two way left turn lane. Um, and also in key locations, 12 foot pedestrian refuge islands. We'll discuss more, more what those pedestrian refuge islands look like in a few minutes. The drive lane is still 11 feet. Um, there's a six foot or a seven foot buffer between uh, the drive lanes and the pedestrian uh, infrastructure, the sidewalk and the multi-use path. And those um, buffers help to maintain safety and comfort for pedestrians by providing a buffer between the roadway and the sidewalk. So on the east side is a six foot sidewalk and the west side is a 12 foot multi-use path, which is intended to be used by both pedestrians and bicyclists. The center turn lane um, allows for left and right driveway exits. Vehicles waiting to turn left no longer cause backup, so that's one of the major benefits of a center turn lane. It also maximizes access to businesses um, as opposed to a situation where you have a divider um, which can make access to businesses more difficult, so that was a major concern on this corridor with all the driveways and access that is needed. The majority of people, as we've mentioned, have issues at least weekly exiting driveways as shown by a survey to date. I'm going to talk about some crossing safety concepts as well that are included in our preliminary recommendations. One of these is the pedestrian refuge island that we talked about previously. You can see an illustration of an example of that there um, so the idea is that you can cross um, to the middle of the roadway where there is a refuge where you can uh, wait um, with some buffering and signage and um, be able to uh, look um, the other direction when you're crossing the rest of the roadway. And so it just provides a lot more safety and comfort for crossing multi-lane roadways. Um, priority placement locations for these could be at schools, um, at Ludecky Park, and possibly at other high traffic crosswalks as needed. The design and, the design and aesthetics uh, for specific pedestrian refuge islands will be part of the discussion for the city-led design and engineering phase um, when, when that phase comes along after the completion of this planning study. A couple of examples of pedestrian refuge islands in a three lane roadway are shown here. Um, this one on the left on Carrollton uh, has a little bit more greenery and landscaping. It also has uh, signage. And then the one on the right is a little bit more bare bones. It has the same basic function. However, it just has a little bit less landscaping. It also has signage indicating that there is a pedestrian crossing. So there is a wide range of uh, possible designs that can be used for um, pedestrian refuge islands. Some more concepts for bicycle pedestrian infrastructure. So sidewalks are typically five to six feet wide and they are meant to solely to accommodate pedestrians. Whereas the shared use path um, that we showed in the cross section 
would be 10 feet or more and shared by shared by bicycles and pedestrians. And sometimes these are striped for with separate lanes for bicycle and pedestrians, and sometimes they are not. Um, again, there's existing community concern over the current roadways unsafe walking spaces uh, that came out in the community survey, um, particularly for students walking to and from school. And initial respondents to the survey show that 119 respondents uh, want safe walking and bicycle infrastructure on Hickory Tree Road. Uh, sidewalk driveway treatments are um, sidewalks that are continued over the driveways to alert drivers to the shared space. So instead of looking like a driveway, it looks like a sidewalk crossing the driveway. Um, this allows for a continuous walking path for pedestrians and reduces interruptions in the flat pavement. Um, this benefits pedestrians with limited mobility, in particular wheelchair users and pedestrians with strollers, but it also benefits any pedestrian because it helps alert um, a drivers to the fact that there is a driveway or a sidewalk crossing this driveway. Um, improving visibility of crosswalks is another recommendation that we have uh, in all weather and lighting conditions. Some examples of ways to do that include high visibility crosswalk paint, um, crosswalk warning signs. You can see an example of that in the picture to the right, uh, as well as vehicle stop lines. And again, there's an example of that. There's a the stop bar uh, horizontal line before the crosswalk and that alerts drivers to the need to at least uh, yield, if not stop, uh, for a crosswalk um, that potentially might have a pedestrian in it. And then additional lighting uh, for nighttime conditions. Pedestrian hybrid beacon is another uh, preliminary recommendation that we have. Um, these beacons are activated by the pedestrian to temporarily halt traffic to allow pedestrians to safely cross. So because these are activated by pedestrians, they are not halting traffic at any other time except when pedestrians need to cross. Um, these cycle through um, uh, static and flashing lights, red lights and yellow lights. Um, and possible locations for these include schools or parks and any other areas with safety concerns. So to give you a little bit more context and understanding of how these hybrid beacons work, we have a video explanation of these beacons where you can see them in action um, on the public engagement page if you would like to view that for more information. Curb radius tightening is another crossing safety concept. Um, this helps to shorten crosswalk distance and also uh, slow down cars that are turning corners. So basically this existing curb that you can see the example of to your right there uh, has a wider turn radius. Um, by adding on a sharper corner to that curb, uh, cars are forced to slow down a bit uh, when they're turning the corner. Uh, so and also it increases um, the or decreases the distance that pedestrians have to cross and be actually in the roadway. So this also increases the visibility of crosswalks and pedestrians. Um, some possible locations for those uh, would be at um, every major intersection, uh, potentially along the study corridor there at Lake June, Bruton, Elam, and, and Quail. So this map shows uh, pedestrian enhancements, uh, preliminary placement recommendations in the uh, north end of the corridor, Lake June Road to Bruton Road. And um, you can see the um, where we're prelim preliminarily recommending placing existing crosswalks. Those are the green dots, uh, new crosswalks, the red dots, and then potential ped refuge islands, which are the yellow squares there. And then this map shows the same thing for the Elam to Lake June Road portion of the corridor. You can see a potential pe pedestrian refuge island location um, up near near the uh, schools, as well as new crosswalk walk locations and enhanced existing crosswalks. 
This shows uh, the current typical cross section uh, bird's eye view compared to the proposed typical cross section, including some of those um, pedestrian enhancements that we just discussed. So uh, the one on the left is the current uh, uh, cross section, which is essentially the two lane, two travel lanes, 60 foot right of way, and a conventional crosswalk. And then on the right is what uh, might be a typical cross section, um, which includes a three lane roadway, 70 foot right of way, two 11 foot travel lanes, one 12 foot center turn lane. There's the 10 foot shared use path with driveway treatments, um, curb ra radius tightening, pedestrian refuge island, high visibility continental crosswalk, as well as the six foot sidewalk with driveway treatments. All right, so the next step in this process is um, wrapping up and we'll continue on with and then wrapping up the public feedback opportunity that we have going currently. So this will be available now through October of 2021 for people to access this presentation as well as the materials that we have on the website, completing the feedback forum and participating in the community survey. And then we anticipate completing the planning study in early 2022. After the planning study, uh, there are several phases to get to construction of the project. Uh, the project design and engineering will be occurring in fiscal year 2022. Uh, roadway acquisition in fiscal year 2023. Utilities uh, relocation in fiscal year 24 and then construction in, in 2025. Right-of-way acquisition. acquisition will um, require meetings with property owners um, after the final roadway design is complete. And uh, please note as well that the City of Balch Springs does not anticipate that they will need to acquire any homes or businesses for the purposes of the right-of-way expansion as a result of the project. That right-of-way expansion will be occurring within the existing frontage occurring along the roadway. However, any right of way acquisition will uh, result in meetings with property owners um, and of course the entire design and engineering phase will also have multiple opportunities for public input. The, construct, uh, the final thing is during construction, there will be a construction schedule and traffic access discussion um, that will be looking at um, the ability of people to be able to get in and out of their properties and be able to access businesses um, during, during the construction process. Okay, so get involved. Uh, we hope that you will participate uh, further in this feedback opportunity. Uh, we have, um, as mentioned in the beginning, we have maps and graphics and external resources available on the web page. Um, we hope that you will complete the feedback form to provide feedback and what we have discussed here. Also, we really encourage you to take the Hickory Tree Road Corridor Survey, which is hosted on the Balch Springs website at that link below. Um, and that will also be open until November. And um, in addition, we are always happy to answer questions or receive any comments that you would like to email us. These are This is our contact information. Um, and we hope to hear from you. And thank you very much for participating in this opportunity to, pro to provide feedback on the Hickory Tree Road Corridor Planning Study. Thank you.